Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us from different parts of the world for the Wednesday evening Bible study from the Remnant Seventh-day Adventist Church here in Maryland, United States. We are glad that you are here this evening. We are studying from the book Maranatha by Ellen White. And today we are meditating on the topic, Your Case, coming up, a reading from March 26. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, I pray that your spirit would guide us and speak to us and help us to understand the important issues of the last days. In Jesus' name, amen. Today we are going to look at three critical points. What it means to fear God, number one. And number two, what it means to give God the glory. And number three, afflicting our souls. Revelation 14, 7 reads, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come. This is the first of the three angels' messages that will go to the whole world before the second coming of Christ. And we are called to do two things because of one thing. On earth, God's people do two things because of one event that takes place in heaven. And what is that solemn event? The hour of his judgment is come. And what are the two things we must do to prepare for that event? It says, fear God and give glory to him. This announcement the hour of his judgment is come, is in the present tense. Other version reads, the hour of his judgment has come or has begun. Many prophets talked about the judgment day. For example, Apostle Paul brought up this topic to Governor Felix. We read in Acts 24, verse 25, and he reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come. When did the judgment begin? We understand from the 2,300 days prophecy of Daniel 8.14 that judgment of, in the heavenly sanctuary commenced from October 22, 1844. We need to thoroughly know how we got to that date. This evening, we are not going to prove that point. If you want to study this topic thoroughly, I have 13 videos on my YouTube channel, Michael Pedrin. Go to the playlist titled 70 Weeks and 2300 Days Prophecy. That is YouTube, Michael Pedrin, and check the playlist 70 Weeks and 2300 Days Prophecy. Beloved, from 1844 to 2024, it is 180 years. We are in the 180th year since judgment began in the heavenly sanctuary. 180 years is a pretty long time. During Noah's time, they had 120 years of warning of judgment before the flood came. So we definitely are at the brink of the second coming of Jesus. In 1844, it started with the dead. Then it moves to the living just before Jesus comes. In Revelation 11, 18, we read, And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come, and the time of the dead that they should be judged that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and to them that fear thy name, small and great, and shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. Yes, it starts with the dead. It says here in this text, the time of the dead that they should be judged. Then it transitions to the living. Ellen White says, it starts from the beginning 
from the first man who died and every successive generation, then it moves to the living. Here in this text, it says, God is going to give reward to them that fear thy name. Notice the word fear. It is in present tense. It doesn't say them that feared thy name in the past tense, but them that fear thy name. Yes, God is going to reward the dead who feared his name while they were alive, but now they are dead. Also, he's going to judge and reward all those who fear his name. They are the living saints who presently fear him as the judgment closes in heaven. The judgment for the living most likely begins around the time of the Sunday law. I want to quote from Ellen White in SDA Bible Commentary, Volume 7a, page 976. She says, the image of the beast will be formed before probation closes, for it is to be the great test for the people of God by which their eternal destiny will be decided. And what are the two things we must do to prepare for the judgment according to our scripture text? Fear God and give glory to him. We will briefly look at both of these, what it means to fear God and what it means to give glory to him. The Greek New Testament word for fear found in Revelation 14 and verse 7 is phobio. It is used not in the sense of being afraid of God, but in the sense of reverence, of awe and respect. It conveys the thought of absolute loyalty to God and full surrender to his will. It is an attitude of the mind that, that is God-centered rather than self-centered. The pen of inspiration says, true reverence for God is inspired by a sense of his infinite greatness and a realization of his presence. With this sense of the unseen, every heart should be deeply impressed. The hour and place of are sacred because God is there. And as reverence is manifested in attitude and demeanor, the feeling that inspires it will be deepened. Holy and reverend is his name, the psalmist declares in Psalm 111 verse 9. Angels, when they speak that name, wail their faces. With what reverence then should we, who are fallen and sinful, take it upon our lips? Ellen White from Prophets and Kings, pages 48 and 49. Yes, we need to have deep reverence for God in our thoughts, in our actions, for that is to fear God. The Bible reveals a link between fearing God and keeping his commandments. For example, we read in Deuteronomy 6 and verse 2, that thou mayest fear the Lord thy God to keep all his statutes and his commandments. Yes, that is why in Revelation we see God saying to fear God, they do one thing very distinctly. They keep his commandments. It says right in Revelation 14, 12, here are they that keep the commandments of God. Why? Because they fear God. Also, it means obeying God in whatever he tells us to do. Remember when God told Abraham to sacrifice his son Isaac, Abraham was implicit in his obedience. And we read in Genesis 22 and verse 12, and he said, lay not thine hand upon thy lad, neither do thou anything unto him, for now I know that thou fearest God. Yes, to fear God is to do whatever God says. Also to fear God is to love what God loves and to hate what God hates. You know, Jesus, when he came as a man, he showed us 
how to truly fear God. The Bible says of Jesus in Hebrews 1 and verse 9, Thou loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Jesus had both of this. He loved something and he hated something. We also, when we fear God, we love something and we'll hate something. Peter tells us about loving the brotherhood is fearing God. In 1 Peter 2.17, it says, Love the brotherhood, fear God. And to fear God is also to hate something. Solomon wrote in Proverbs 8 and verse 13, The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. So to fear God is to love what God loves and to hate what God hates. In Ecclesiastes chapter 12, Solomon sums it all up, what it means to fear God and why we need to fear God. In Ecclesiastes 12 verses 13 and 14, it says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. This is not just the conclusion of what Solomon wrote, but this is the conclusion of the final proclamation of the gospel of the three angels' message. Remember the first angel's message mentions fear God and about the hour of his judgment. And the third angel's message says the saints keep the commandments of God. Yes, Ecclesiastes chapter 12, 13 and 14 summarizes the three angels' message. This is the conclusion of the redemption story on planet Earth 2. Now we'll go to our second point. What does it mean to give glory to him? Revelation 14, verse 7. We are told in the pen of inspiration, to give glory to God is to reveal his own, uh, to reveal his character in our own and thus make him known. Ellen White comments in SDA Bible Commentary, Volume 7, page 979. It means that God's character will be manifested in his children's life, and thus God is glorified. Jesus came to reveal God's glory, God's character to us. John chapter 1 and verse 14 says, And we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. God calls us also, especially the saints of the last days, to have a life full of grace and truth, because that is what will bring God the glory. Remember Moses asked God something in Exodus chapter 33, 18 and 19, and he said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee. The goodness of God, the character of God is the glory of God. Jesus told us in Matthew 5 verse 16 in the Sermon on the Mount, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. We do not do good works to earn salvation, no. It is a free gift through Jesus Christ. But when we are in Jesus, who is the light of the world, we also become the light of the world. And he does the good works through us by which we bring glory to God. How else do we glorify God? Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31, whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. Interesting, Paul mentions the first thing here that brings glory to God is about our food, whether you eat or drink. So is it possible that God's end time people glorify God by a healthy lifestyle? I want to read from Councils on Diet, page 69. I was again shown that the health reform is one branch of the great work 
which is to fit the people for the coming of the Lord. It is closely connected with the third angel's message as the hand is with the body. Remember from 1844 onwards, we have been living in the great day of atonement. One thing that the children of Israel did on the day of atonement was to fast. But their fast was only on one day, the 10th the day of the seventh month. But for us who are living in the antitypical day of atonement, it has been 150 years since the, 180 years since the judgment began in heaven. It is impossible, therefore, for us as a people to fast for years after, for years. Our fast, therefore, must be different. I want to quote from Medical Ministry, page 283. The servant of the Lord says, true fasting which we, that which should be recommended to all is abstinence from every stimulating kind of food and the proper use of the wholesome, simple food which God has provided in abundance. God wants us to go back to the diet that he gave Adam and Eve in the beginning. The diet before the flood. There was no flesh involved there. God wants us to go back. And that is the true fast we are told here that we should have on the antitypical day of atonement. As we close, we'll look at the last point. Afflicting our souls. What does it mean? It says in Leviticus chapter 23 verse 29. For whatsoever soul it be that shall not be afflicted, in that same day he shall be cut off from among his people. They were not permitted to live if they did not afflict the souls on the day of atonement. Everyone fasted. Everyone prayed. They searched their hearts. They made things right with God. They made things right with each other, lest they die. We read in Exodus 32 and verse 33. And the Lord said unto Moses, Whoever had sinned against me, him will I blot out from my book. Names from the book of life would be blotted out on the day of judgment if they were not repented and not confessed. In our today's reading of Maranatha, we read, In like manner, all who would have their names retained in the book of life should now in the few remaining days of their probation afflict their souls before God by sorrow for sin and true repentance. There must be deep, faithful searching of heart. There is earnest warfare before all who should subdue the evil tendencies that strive for the mastery. Right now, Jesus is ministering in front of the mercy seat to grant mercy and pardon for those who have truly repented. And who will receive mercy on the day of atonement? Proverbs 28, 13 says, He that covereth his sin shall not prosper, but whosoever confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. Yes, two things God requires of us. Number one, confess our sins. Number two, forsake them. For that is true repentance. Confessing without forsaking is fake confession. Like David, we have to pray and ask God to search our hearts and to cleanses, as he said in Psalm 139, 23 and 24, he cried, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Dear brothers and sisters, is that your desire to have your names Retained in the Lamb's Book of Life? If so, 
then decide in your hearts even now and tell him to help you truly to fear God, to give God the glory and to afflict your souls. May we all get ready as your case and my case will be coming up very soon in the heavenly judgment. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, I pray that none of us would be weighed in the balance and found wanting. Help us to fear God now. Help us to give glory to God now. Help us to afflict our souls now so that we might be ready when our names are taken. Have mercy on us, God, and bless us. In Jesus' name, amen.